cohort members. Sorry, slipping up. Uh, I'm Dr. Carter and Hi, I'm Bree, back again to talk about <laughs> Hortense Spillers and all of the magic that is Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. Yes. Make sure you grab that syllabus on the website so that you can follow along. Uh, the essay is also on the website, in the syllabus and on the website. So um, make sure you're following along because this is a complex read, but it's an important one. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody jumping in on Facebook and joining us. So quickly, if you did not catch Monday's discussion with me and Julesy, that's where we kicked this thing off. And we started talking about the first few questions from the syllabus, but also how to familiarize ourselves with text that is dense, that requires us to use the glossary, which is also included in the text. CJ um, and Dr. Hines, Alicia did a great job with compiling the glossary for this and helping us along with these key terms and motifs that are along the side of the syllabus as well. So please do not feel intimidated by words like ontology or conceptions of black women's socialization and things that take a little bit more time to jump on Google to define and get immersed in because the syllabus really helps you dive into all of that technical language and theory. Also, and with, side note, if you have like an iPhone or anything, you can actually just say, well, I don't want to say it right now. Yeah. But thanks to the, the, you know, AI assistant <laughs> named Siri. <laughs> uh, and she will decide things for you. So it helps. <laughs> you don't always have to go um, searching somewhere else. It's an easier way um, to navigate the language of this text, so. Yes, I see somebody saying they have to stop word for word. Um, <laughs> I appreciate when you have to baby step it, look, you're like, I wanna be clear. And that also helps us avoid misreading because unfortunately it is very common with black women's work, with black feminist work that people misread, they misconstrue, and then we get these misconceptions that spread about the work. So taking it slow and rocking at your own pace and reading along and joining in on the Facebook group. People are always over there sharing, y'all, did you understand this? I'm at this part of the text, who's here with me? And people jump in the comments. So that is always great. Yeah. Before Nicole and I, Dr. Carter jump in, I'm going to recap a little bit more of me and Julesy's time together. So we talked about um, the confounded identities that are um, adhered and put upon black female flesh. We talked a lot about children and children's identity in relation to this idea of the bastard um, and the property of the father. We also talked a lot, a lot about what happens with the Atlantic slave trade, the kidnapping of black folk from West Africa primarily, and this racialization, um, this ethnicization that happens, especially in terms of the Moynihan Report. So that's where we kicked it off a lot with part one. And with part two, we're gonna be jumping back in around page 67, if you have the syllabus or a copy of the essay in front of you. So let me get there. And we're gonna be talking about the question in the syllabus and leading off on what distinction does Spillers draw between the body and the flesh? Okay, so I mean, I. Okay, this is my first time reading this. Uh, I've read Beloved like tons of times. I've taught Beloved, and this makes so much more sense like putting them together. So, but in reading this, I really had to kind of think differently about this. Um, and so, what I think, I'm gonna say what I think, what I think um, is, is being um spoken about here written about is um i i put it like put an example um you can say whatever about the body and do whatever to the body but the flesh knows like the flesh like, yeah so and the flesh is the terrain where violence occurs um but then we also see like healing occurs too but that's yeah. like you know elsewhere, but it is a clear, clear distinction. Um, and so I don't know, like for me, I've always focused on um, 
uh, the body um, and women's bodies, actually, particularly Black women's bodies. Um, but this makes me think differently about it because yeah. I see violence as an attack on the body. Like, you know, but now it's like, no, it's deeper than that. It's, it's a memory. It's imprinted. And so it's imprinted within our bodies. It goes deeper. And so the flesh um, is deeper. And that's what I thought was being being said. How about you? Yeah. So I have a couple of things written down in the margins of the text. So I got the the straight like JSTOR copy, and then I have the the syllabus copy. And what I wrote in the syllabus question copy was on page sixty seven, where Spiller says, "Before the body," um, I believe that's in that first sort of half a paragraph mm -hmm. we get before we start getting full paragraphs. And from there, I said, there is the flesh, that zero degree of social conceptualization that does not escape concealment under the brush of discourse. So that's what Spiller said. And then flesh is like a primary narrative. And then the body is like the liberated subject position. So like flesh is like, if we're talking about language because Spiller is, is a, a professor of English, thinking about the flesh is like the rough text, right? Before that primary document and then the body being the ways that we map different meaning onto language. So like, mm -hmm. if we're thinking about a raw paragraph before we even make sense of the sentences, that's how I think of the flesh. And then the body being the meaning that we make of that paragraph. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah, I mean, actually that, that makes a lot of sense for me and it helps um, in clarifying the differences between, between the two. Um, do you want me to put this? Yeah, I was reading the, this is the body keeps the score, except it should be the flesh keeps the score because experience yes. has become part of the DNA. Yes. Yeah, like, so, Very I, just much so. About, I just kept thinking about um, um, post-traumatic slave syndrome and, you know, like that book and uh, but also like this theory of, you know, what happens to, and I think in all these other text, it talks about the body. Mm -hmm. um, but if we are using this term, it actually makes sense that it's like imprinted within um, and the flesh is the thing that continues. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I it's just a different way of looking at uh, yeah. a lot of these things that we're used to reading. Um, yeah, epigenetics. Yep. Mm -hmm. And even with that, this different way of reading, when Spillers puts it in the context of the Atlantic um, slave trade on that first full paragraph after the quote I just shared, she says, even though the European hegemonies stole bodies, some of them female, out of West African communities in concert with the African middleman, we regard this human and social irreparability as high crimes against the flesh. As mm -hmm. the person of African females and African males registered the wounding, if we think of the flesh as a primary narrative, then we mean it's seared, divided, ripped apartness, riveted to the ship's hole, fallen or escaped overboard. And just thinking about like, people think about this conception of the body as the liberated part, the liberated being. But Spiller subverts that or even reorients us to understand like they stole bodies, mm -hmm. but what has happened and what is imprinted on the flesh. Yeah, and I, so when I'm reading this, I keep thinking about, so when it says primary narrative, um, I just keep thinking about research, <laughs> like primary sources, right? Like this, uh, the uh, thing that is the whole, and then somehow we like destruct, you know, like we tear it apart. And I mean, that's yeah. what she actually says, um, ripped apartness, divided, seared. Um, and it's left as like pieces in pieces. Yeah. Um, so there's a question. Uh, so let's see if I can. Yeah. There it is. Uh, so for spillers, it's the flesh, the superficial part of the body that comes into contact with things. I don't think spillers would use the language superficial. Um, let me actually, hmm, I think there's a part on the next page, 
to answer this question um, or to jump ahead on page 68, Spiller says, and he starts getting into the captive body. Mm-hmm. And I think the comes in contact with things. Yeah, so when you're talking about trauma, I think it's not the flesh or the body that's coming in contact with those things, but the, the sites of captivity. I think Spillers will argue that like, whether it's the body or the flesh, they're both being mutilated. Mm-hmm. Where she says, even though the captive flesh slash body has been liberated and no one pretend that and no one need pretend that even the quotation marks do not matter. Dominant symbolic activity, the ruling episteme that releases the dynamics of naming evaluation remains grounded in the originating metaphors of captivity and mutilation. So that it is as if neither time nor history nor historiography in its topic shows movement. As the human subject is murdered over and over again by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous archism showing itself in the endless disguise. So I think the the part that gets to the trauma or whatever, as the as this person is offering us in the comments, is more about what is happening to the captive. Mm-hmm. Um, because on page sixty eight, Spillers gets into it. it. Really doesn't matter whether you think of it as the captive body or the flesh. Once you get to the site of the plantation, once you get to the site of this mutilation and this captivity, they become almost indistinguishable. Yeah. 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 Um. And I also just, I don't know, like, I think it is, to me, it is important to think of, think about it as like layers of, so putting these last two comments together, layers of trauma, um, but they're, they're both, uh, you know, experience it, experiencing those traumas um, collectively or simultaneously. So, and I think that's what you were reading. Yeah. Um, do you want to go to the next? Yeah. And, oh yeah, I made another note just to make sure that folks are. So I also said, furthermore, I argue that under the rule of dominance, there is no distinction. That's what Spiller is also offers on 68. And so I think Spiller is also saying there used to be a distinction. There could have been before the site of, of being kidnapped, but then the Atlantic slave trade happens, right? And so we don't even have the collective memory and thus the collective language to address what would have been a liberated flesh. Yeah. Because that has been, it's been wounded and mutilated and it's been taken, or as Filler says at the top, like forgotten um, and failed. Yeah. Okay. So our next question, uh, Spillers insists upon a theory or means of discussion that accounts for the violence of the African female subject. How does female flesh become ungendered? Ooh. I would <laughs> almost say that if you take any word away from mama's baby, papa's maybe it's this conception of ungendered because Spillers really set the academic and <laughs> theoretical streets on fire in 1987 with this concept of being ungendered. Yeah. Um, and when I think about it, ungendered um, means that it something denies or, yeah, denies uh, markers and social conceptualization. So those constructs that we're, that are created um, don't apply here. Right. They're rendered like, mm, what's the word? Like, I don't want to just say null and void, but like, yeah, basically, Mm -hmm. like. I mean, if you think about the African female um, at that time, right? Like, and and many can argue like (laughs) still today uh, often, uh, but at that time, like there is no um, humanity to that, to Mm -hmm. that, person and I'm using quotation marks. Right on purpose. And that's it. You know, so um so essentially as seen by those who are like colonizers and abusers and um Mm -hmm. they are ungendered. Yeah. Um, And and Spillers gives these Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. 
I was going to say, and Spilly gives this very um, detailed example at the top of 68, right, where she talks about these externalized acts of torture and prostration, where she's describing a female body strung from a tree limb or breeding from the breast or any given day of field work because the overseer standing the wing the length of a whip has popped her flesh open, adds a lexical and living dimension to the narratives of women in culture and society. This materialized scene of unprotected female flesh, a female flesh un ungendered, offers a praxis and a theory, a text for living and for dying, and a method for reading both through their diverse mediation. Yeah. And for me, just that ongoing violence of living and dying, that's also the ungendering, right? Of, I think Spillers there is giving us this image of the violence is in the torture as the living and dying. Like you're living through as this African female flesh, this African female subject through the experience of being in the field, being watched, being whipped. And it's like living and dying over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then people try to extrapolate your experience and be like, oh, Oh, no, suffered less, or women, the women on the suffer less than men. It's really just oh like, where did y'all get that? Gosh. Like, have y'all read a book? Y'all haven't read? Did you actually like comprehend things that were written? Or no, you just so <laughs> like, because I think literally Bell Hooks offers it in Aren't I a Woman? Mm -hmm. Angela Davis gives it to us a women racing class and Spillers ran it back and was like, where are y'all getting this <laughs> idea that gender was refuge on the plantation? And that's really it for me. Like, where did y'all think that there was compassion for anybody who was property I on mean, the plantation? Sure. Like, if you think about it, not only are these women being whipped, right? Like they're being whipped and and basically their their bodies like to the flesh, right? Being cut and like all these things, but they're also being subjected to rape, right? Like, so it's like this complexity and like heightened amount of violence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, hello, where are you getting it? <laughs> but yeah, it's just, yeah, it's a, uh, and I, these things um, have continued. I know we're still talking about, you know, like um, enslavement, but these, like many have argued over the years, like for example, black women can't be raped, right? So yeah, this, I mean, it's an argument that people have. It's argued by the state, right? Like that comes from the US government saying, we are not going to recognize the violence under law, like de jour, de facto, whichever one you want to take, it doesn't, it wasn't clarified in legislation by, especially by Southern and state legislatures for decades post reconstruction. Like when we talk about the ways that being ungendered in your lived experience, in your experience of living and dying comes up, this is it. It's this ongoing ungendering through these externalized acts of torture. When we talk about violence and the violence of gender itself, it's also this thing, this this theory of living or embodiment that like we project our own understandings of our socialization onto gender, and then we map those onto people. Mm -hmm. So that's another part of when we talk about <laughs> the ways that Spillers calls our attention in the first part of our discussion, to gender being nonsensical, right? Spiller says dumb. It's like, y'all are taking these lived experiences, y'all are taking the Western sciences, the Western theorization, and mapping it on to African flesh that was stolen and brought through these experiences of torture. And does that make sense to you? To make sense of your living, your being, based upon a metric by yeah. people who were using your body for labor and casting you away. And you're still relying on those principles and ideas. Literally, your face is spillers in this text being like, does it make, make gender make sense for me, for Black people? Make it make sense for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody uh, asked a question about what was that relating to? You can, I urge everybody to look up um, laws relating to sexual violence 
Mm -hmm. um, if you can stomach it for black women, I think that's what that question was related to. And just see the nitty gritty of black women were not protected at all under the law. Um, mm -hmm. And it also would not make sense when you think about lynch law. Women were given smaller physical mass, but were quantifiable by the same rules of her male counterpart. Mm. Where is that quote from? Mm -hmm. If anybody could offer where they just pulled that quantifiable quote from, I would yeah. appreciate that citation. Yeah, I'll put it there. Then yeah, we have that one. I'm going to put that there. Hold on. I know we're talking about the not gendering, but it's a weird gendered, ungendered. The black woman's body is gendered because it's partially equal to what a man is. It is a reproductive body, it's a rapable body, and yet it's still not sufficiently gendered body because it's not a white gendered woman body. Essentially gendering is understood through racing. Yeah, that leads us also mm -hmm. to, I'm thinking about Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham um, and the meta language of race, like the definition of lady is Victorian, it's white, mm -hmm. that's how we understand it. And so gender is this very complex, it's like, you get the flesh, you're mapping your socialization onto the flesh, but the continued presence of racialized flesh renders gender like it's incomprehensible, mm -hmm. right? And that's another point Spillers points us to again and again is how are you mapping these things onto captive flesh? How are you mapping the, these concepts onto captive bodies? And to me, it's interesting, and I, I know it's skipping ahead again, but like, it's just really interesting how we continue to utilize those. I mean, even Black women utilize these same gender uh, ideas of, um, well, and, and talking about <laughs> uh, Higginbotham, uh, respect, yeah. right? Like, so, um, yeah, I don't know. And what does it serve for us, right? When we lean into, and we want stability is also some people argue it's about safety and survival. And I hear that, but when you talk about the real violences that are sort of inevitable, right? Like the violence of the state, the violence of scarcity of resources meted out by the state, the, the violences you're beating back by respectability, by performing gender, by adhering and tethering ourselves to gender. Spillers really calls us to question, is that the project you wanna be working on, right? Because right. a part of her pointing us to captivity is you're focusing on being gendered and you're being tortured day after day. And so is gender the task of the violence that you wanna take up or could we be looking elsewhere? <sighs> and that question just like, oof. Well, and, and for me, like as someone who like teaches uh, women's and sexuality studies and, you know, focused on black feminist epistemologies and things like that, like it, it really puts into question, it questions everything that, you know, we were taught to uh, theorize. Um, mm -hmm. It puts a twist on it. Uh, and maybe that's why I wasn't featured. That might be why. <laughs> because when you get, when you start from spillers, where else can you go? But people do build on spillers. And that's where we get like C. Riley Storton and so many amazing people who are doing things with black trans studies of like, maybe we need to think about, is it an opening up? And is it an expansion of gender so that everybody, mm -hmm. as many genders as there are people, is it a disposal of gender because it's not a project that works for black folk? Um, so I'm really, I'm sitting in it too every day for the past like two weeks. When I tell you gender has been beating me up <laughs> as a theoretical concept. Yeah. And I, and I think it like going back to what you said, expanding these, these ideas of gender, it doesn't mean that you can't study gender. It just means that we have more work. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's more to do consistently. Yes. <laughs> like we can't just say, okay, so we are going to take, there's man and woman. Spillies is like, now, where did you, are you doing the reading? Are you listening? 
You're not at all. But You're I mean, like, in reading her her work, like a lot of people brought up um, uh, Judith Butler, who mm -hmm. you know um, saw gender as a performance as well. Um, and I was trying to look up when she wrote that to see if they were in Gender Trouble. Mm, I'm forgetting the publication date for Gender Trouble, but I do think Spillers was first. If anybody in the comments can pull up that um, citation for Judith Butler. And thank you, I see that the quote is on page 72 and in getting into the quantifiable. So, so she as we look- 1990, it was published in 1990. Well, <laughs> Spillers in 1987 was like, so we can just, everybody read it, think, come back. If you think it still fits with our captivity, you know? I would ask you to read it again. <laughs> so, so, but Spiller's actually, yeah, she wrote it first. This idea of, you know, um, the performance and conceptualization or construct of gender. Yeah. yeah. And Spiller's analysis, it hit different and and harder to the question of power for me because Spillers does get to that. It's about captivity. Even when we talk about expressions, performances, socializations, community, yes, yes, yes. But also when we're talking about the experiences of African folk, people descended from folks who were who were kidnapped and brought across this journey that Christina Sharp called in the wake, right? across that journey of the Middle Passage, it's very particularly about being captive flesh and captive mm -hmm. body and not being a liberated subject. Because right. when you think about the ability to consent to performing a gender, how do we even get there when you're being tortured and brutalized? Right. And as you point us to in our contemporary moment, like how far are we from those experiences of torture and brutalization when we think about the state? No. So. No. I mean, that's just a new way to, you know, um, surveil and and capture. So, yeah, it, and I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but uh, yeah. there are similarities in a lot of ways. Um, so, and I think that definitely leads us into our our next question, where Alicia's. And Alicia call us to question, words will most certainly kill us from page 68. What according to Spillers are the limitations of language, of freedom? What remains after the captive flesh slash body is liberated? They truly so, dove in their bag <laughs> with these questions. Yeah, they're really good. And they call it, they make you think and actually work through the text though. It's like you really have to. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about these questions was, um, so just as like these social constructions um, don't exactly do it, you know, in terms of um, defining who we are, right? Like, mm -hmm. so for example, gender being like this larger, um, fluid uh, thing, uh, the same thing exists with language. And so mm -hmm. um, it is, it's really, words are, uh, so one here, words are the things that cause um, trouble and they cause damage um, and it causes um, ideas of unworthiness. So I think she was talking about um, the, so the captive flesh, um, the market, a to total objectification as the entire captive community becomes a living laboratory. And so somebody had to identify, you know, what this captive flesh was. Somebody had to use words and labeling and naming to um, come up with these ideas of whose, whose bodies and lives were um, worthy of being captive or un unworthy enough yeah. um, to become, you know, um, 
to become laborers and possessions. So mm -hmm. um, here, I think it's, it's used in a lot of ways, like uh, the body um, has been used to um, denigrate and mutilate um, Black women, um, but also it is, I don't think it, it we have enough um, to, like language is limited. So, um, yeah. yeah. So in terms of um, the limitations of language, um, you can go ahead. Language is its limitation. <laughs> yeah, I get you. So I, I offered that the limit of language is our engagement. We give so much to language via our surface level assumptions that ignore epistemes, ideologies, and most importantly, power, right? Like when we make meaning of words, are we paying attention to, to the power that we're giving them and the ways that words themselves are used um, to exert and express power? Like I'm thinking at that section um, where Spillers writes, we must concede at the very least that sticks and, st that sticks and breaks might break our bones, but words will most certainly kill us. I thought immediately of Toni Morrison's Nobel Prize um, speech. If y'all have not listened, I know it's on Spotify and on YouTube. Toni Morrison delivers an amazing narrative, but she also talks about words can be the violence. Language can be the violence. When we think about how things are recorded, carried out, how they're spread, that power of narrative yeah. is so crucial to talk about. And so what is liberation for a captive body? What document is powerful? what document is so powerful it can cure the living and dying of captive bodies and flesh. So I thought about that in terms of what do we give language too much power to do? Like I'm thinking constantly about the rhetoric of when black people are talking about our um, continuous disempowerment and disenfranchisement by the state, people are like, but Lincoln did the Emancipation Proclamation and everything was written down and enslaved folks were free from the plantation. I'm like, how much credit are we giving to the language of a document to free people who were tortured and beaten and killed day after day? Like, how do we think that an Emancipation Proclamation, that language and a document from a US president can do that? Are we giving language too much power? And is that also the limit of freedom? We are, are we giving because... freedom too much power? Yeah, because we are like if you look throughout history and if you if you use that as an example, right, anytime that power connected to freedoms and liberations and rights for people of color or those who just have, you know, been marginalized throughout this country, um, mm -hmm. those words mean nothing. So it's it's always something can be enacted and it means nothing. I mean, if you look at the Emancipation Proclamation. You knew that like these were signed, but those words meant nothing, right? Like that didn't mean people were gonna act on what happened, right? So and, and so it, it just reminds me of this idea of like, so it has no, unless the, the language has meaning, you know, for both parties or all parties involved, nothing happens from it. So, yeah. I don't know. And I see the comments on the side about it being trippy um, <laughs> because you enter a language, you are always limited by this language, right? Because we are functioning within it. We are being engaged mm -hmm. by the language. We are trying to carry out or to the best of our ability, right? Maybe even offer new language. Like Spillers offers us new language of ungendering, but just because she offered it does not mean people will engage with the body differently because the Emancipation Proclamation was signed does not change the, the history and the historiography of how people treat people that were once or still are captive flesh, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm even thinking now about when you get the Emancipation Proclamation, but then you get convict leasing, right? All up and through the South, Black people are being affected by Black codes, right? And just loitering becomes one of the most punishable offenses and you're taken off to do labor that is essentially still enslavement. So right. when you get into language, language can be manipulated by the powerful. It can be manipulated against the captive. And language really has to be identified in particular communities. 
language in one space is not going to function the same elsewhere. And language yeah. that empowers you in one space might not empower you in all spaces. Correct. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that is an important, I guess, um, idea to share is that, yes, there are limitations to language. And those li limitations look different in different spaces and for different people. So. And it's and heavy, last, like that last question, what remains after the captive flesh body is liberated? The history, like what you said, the history still, it still remains. Those memories still remain. Um, and the, the trauma um, imprinted on our flesh and bodies still remain. They continue. Mm -hmm. They continue to affect all of us today. Like so, um, so again, <laughs> the language is, is limited. Right. <laughs> And even with that question, um, I would love for, I need to hit up um, CJ and Alicia when we hop off and be like, what remains after the captive flesh slash body is liberated? It's like, is the captive flesh and body ever liberated? Is liberation final? Do we, con do we think of it as final? Because Spillers points to this um, in the very beginning, like this spatial temporal moment, right? Like, I am sure if I can only imagine the feeling that might have been joy, might have been something else for people who were enslaved on the plantation at the time that the Emancipation Proclamation came down, it might have felt like liberation. It might have felt like a moment of a new horizon, a new chance, a new dawn, right? But can liberation be fleeting? Can it be momentary? So what I, I keep thinking about is, so when we're thinking about the flesh and the body, and I think she brings it up briefly, but I don't, I don't see a place for um, just like ideas of mental captivity, right? And so I'm thinking about liberation mentally and how that plays a role in this because there is no doubt that we are, are um, you know, like we are, can be seen as uh, captive flesh and bodies. Um, but I also think that there is a form of libera liberation that happens. Like for example, you and I talking right now, like the ability to share this information, the ability to, right, like, mm -hmm. Uh, explain this information in a way that is um, freeing for others. Uh, is, is that is that a form of liberation, or mm. and that we're using, uh, as Audrey Lord would say, the master's tools to do that? So, like, <laughs> and that I would argue that that leads us into this last question, which to me is a. When I hit this last question of what is an American grammar, it's exactly what you explain, right? Like Spillers doesn't only talk about an American grammar as the language, literally at the level of text, of history, of flesh, of power relation between captive um, and capturer, right? Between the, the nation state as capturer, but also an American grammar to me refers to like this symbolic order um, that Spillers is taking us through in this essay where she's assessing the language of African torture and captivity um, and how it's continuously engaged by the United States. Because again, back to this spatial temporal thing that Spillers starts off with, like she's talking about Moynihan in the 1960s, but she's also talking about the plantation and she's drawing those spatial temporal links of like, do you see how we get from here directly over here and onward? I see you got some comments. There is no liberation because the liberation uses the same language. Uh, this and then this one might be for you on the mental liberation. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's the same person that said another quote uh, further up about no liberation unless we use a new language. So, but what if your mental liberation is still using the same language? The only way for mental liberation is to create a new language that doesn't bound you to the old language. 
So nice. that's a tall order, if nothing mm -hmm. else. New language, new words. Mm -hmm. um, and for you, Nicole, would you say that on this question of language, do you feel that language is just new words, like the creation of new words, or is it the entire engagement? No, I think it's the the entire engagement. So, I mean, the whole thing, like everything we've been talking about um, is like the meaning uh, behind these things. And so um, it would be the meaning, but also how we're utilizing it and what, um, you know, like it, is that language harming someone else? Is that language keeping mm. someone else? uh like enslaved or captive um so and how do we begin to create this new language because i think this this connects to what you were talking about and then like so i know Julesy wanted us to talk about spillers and morrison together because one of the things that happened happened is that this captive body became linguistically like so according to law mm -hmm. free right and so um what does that mean to have to create so that's creating a new language too like having to conceptualize your life the, the only life mm -hmm. that you need as something different um and, and um, even with that I'm also thinking of when you when you started us off and you talked about how it gives new meaning, both pieces give new meaning to each other for you and your experience of reading them. I'm thinking of the real life experience that gives us beloved, right? Like Margaret Garner's trial, the way that the state is like, do we use the word murder? Because murder implies humanity, right? Mm -hmm. The state was grappling with language around the captive flesh. They were like, now y'all, if we say that she murdered a baby, then we are acknowledging that that baby is person, that they are people. And they decided we're not gonna call it murder because to call it murder, to label it murder in the court of law in the United States would mean that we are giving these captive properties, these human commodities, right? If you're going to use language from City of Hartman, we're giving them so much personhood in this court by the state, we can't do it. So we need to call it something else. Yep, definitely. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's definitely meaning behind that, the new language. So, and how do you construct that? Um, and I mean, essentially language was constructed in the first place. So in all, mm -hmm. all societies, so it started somewhere. <laughs> You know, and so um, I, it can be uh, <laughs> constructed. It can be undone, right? Yes. Anything that can be created can be undone. Right? Isn't yeah. that also physics? Um, nothing is ever, but physics also tells us like nothing is destroyed. It can be recreated. We can put the, the energy that we give to this language elsewhere. And that point that you made earlier about is our new language going to isolate somebody else? I definitely think about that in terms of um, the suffragette movement and right the Black women of the 18th and 19th century who were adjacent to it, who were like, we want to get in on the, I don't want to say rights and privileges, but the signification of womanhood, of being lady, right? Because the way that white women are treated, it does something for them. But now that we're years out from that, centuries out, we can see that like, that language isolated somebody. Like when we think about queer and trans folks, the language of lady and woman is constantly weaponized. It is, it is constantly tethered to, to genitals, to access to, to healthcare, and it is weaponized against folks who are in our community and who are experiencing captivity through the state, through racism, through power alongside us. And so that language, right, that so many wanted to open up, it's, it's a new confining logic, right? Like even when we think we are expanding somewhere, unless we consider everybody, like we have to think so expansively about what liberation is to start mapping out that language. Like what is your goal? Whom, which communities, which people, which flesh, which bodies? And then maybe you can conceive of new language. 
And what is your definition of liberation as well? So like whose conceptualization of liberation are we using? So it's, it's deeply complex. And what that, <laughs> when I finished part one of Spiller, that's when I left off of like, Spiller gives us a lot of language and she leaves us with a lot of questions, especially at the end of part one. When you try to apply this to your own relationship to language, when you do this engagement that we're doing, of what am I tethered to? What does the language of body give me? What have I given to the definition of flesh? And when you try to parse through this with yourself as you're annotating, as you're reading, and you're just hit time after time with these questions, yeah. And have been sitting on them the way that she's been sitting on them and teaching us since 1987. It's like, this is no small project. I don't, oh, you got a real long comment there. <laughs> I see some connections being made to Mornay. Do you see that long comment? Mm -hmm. I don't even know if our viewers will see it when we put it up, but I can read it out if you put up the, okay. the first you part. Put up? Okay. I love how in-depth Spillage is with language. Spillage begins the text with peaches, brown sugar, and as she says, there's no easy way for agents buried beneath them to come clean. Those names are not only weaponized against Black people by whites, but as she cites Moynihan, weaponized against Black women by Black men. Welfare queen, single mother, used to diminish shame and gain power over Black women. The shaming has left some women without resources that they need to survive. I'm thinking of how Nikki Kendall um, Mickey Kendall, sorry, discusses public housing and hood feminism. I know some women who rather live in toxic environments than receive government assistance because they cannot stand the negative connotations and violence associated with public housing. That's application. Yes. That's the work of language does something, mm -hmm. even intra communally, right? Like when we talk about within the communities of Black folk, language is weaponized and it's weaponized alongside power. Definitely. Wait, do we got another? We got another. <laughs> oh, somebody is asking about how that relates. So that's part two. So today is the second half of part one. So we're only reading up to page 69. Yeah, so we're only going up to page 69. Nothing on page 69 except for that one sentence. So yeah. Spillers gets the Equiano um, and others in part two. So we're going to save that for later on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking of what you were talking about, uh, language and the body and things like that, because um, I've been doing a lot of thinking and reading and writing about um, corporeality and what it means to be like this normalized body, um, especially mm -hmm. as uh, someone with like um, with autoimmune diseases and different things like that and and how language is used to and technically uh, invisible disability right so like how language mm -hmm. is used to denigrate those and objectify those um, who have disabilities as well but to be a black woman with a disability and how language just like <laughs> is right <laughs> the violence so, is deeply complex um so um yeah i just the violence and even if we're thinking about right now and the world like the, the pandemic that we're living in and the role that language plays, even using the term pandemic and, you know, like just, and what it means for like, or again, that idea of normalcy, um, redefining things, whose definitions are we using, right? Like who, I don't know, these are, I. And so and I'm gonna I say about that a lot because it makes this reading like just mm -hmm. makes me think a lot, and it flips things that I have like fear, like thought about continuously for years on its head. So yeah. yeah, for for that comment that you offer us about the language of the pandemic and normalcy, I definitely thought about this in relation to whenever the pandemic is over 
by whose metric are we measuring over? Because mm -hmm. as you point to, there will be people in disabled folk and community, there will be people who become disabled because of complications dealing with COVID-19. When is their pandemic over? How do we mark these, these experiences of time? By whose experience? And then the language becomes that codifier, right? That, that marker of a specific experience and everybody else has to make meaning from that codified, whatever. Like we, even when we talk about rewriting history, revisionist history, like we're giving, again, we're talking about the level of language of somebody already wrote this story. This story is already um, bought into by and large somebody else, largely marginalized communities, largely scholars who come from marginalized community have to pick up all of our work, dedicate our time and resources and energy to, this is how our people, our communities experience this event. And we have to do a rewriting. And and even when people within our community have, have provided counter narratives, right, or additional narratives, like they're still rewriting to happen because mm -hmm. who, even within our, again, like within our community, who's given the, the uh, like the ability to rewrite? Mm -hmm. And that is a point where in terms of things I'm still questioning on gender, <laughs> thinking with spillers, I'm thinking about Yes, Spillers understands the whole conception of gender to be nonsense, but I also think Spillers is saying something of the meaning that people within uh, marginalized communities descended from these captive bodies, right? Like talking about the intra-community meaning for Black folks. Like when you pick up this nonsense, this is what you get. We're reproducing these violences. When you pick up and you buy into the nonsense <laughs> of gender, we violate each other. We suffer these violences ourselves. We suffer the violence of gender, but also when you think that the, the violence of gender has meaning and you weaponize that against somebody else, this is where we get the marginalization. Mm -hmm. This is where we get all of the scholarship from Black feminists of y'all bought in, y'all bought into this. The powerful, the powerful even within our own communities bought into this idea of gender and it has been weaponized and I have been violated, I have been denied resources. I have suffered the violence of language of being called welfare queen, not just by the state, but by folk in my community, right? Mm -hmm. And even further within the community of black womanhood, right? It's not just black men who violate black women with the language of welfare queen. Then we get to class analysis. Yes. And then we get into the inter-community harm of black women weaponizing language against black women. So we have to sit with all of the violence of language. Yes. Thanks, Spillers. <laughs> right, we come to this end and like, oh, this is the end of part one <laughs> in our understanding yeah, of an American grammar one. book. <laughs> and we got 12 more pages to go. Of... Be right on up by <laughs> Hortense Spillers. And this isn't even, like to think of this, Nicole, this isn't even a long, long form text. This is not, we haven't gotten to full length, 200 plus pages of spillers. And to think she ate everybody right on up <laughs> in these first few pages. She didn't need a, but <laughs> she didn't need any more pages. <laughs> she clearly knew how to utilize language in her favor. favor. So uh, <laughs> this, this writing, this actual piece has been called, um, poetic as well as, um, you know, philosophical and social theory, so. Right, and this is one that people continuously put on syllabi. This piece alone has birthed whole new, whole new other people's books. It has birthed whole dissertations for others of grappling with the questions that Spillers offers. I hope it's offering folks something if you're watching this back 
if you're about to hop on to the Smart Brown Girl Facebook and start talking about questions around gender and violence and language. I want to hop on there after this and ask people, so how did part one go? Um, so I hope folks can join us over there as we wrap this up. Yeah, and th these are important questions that she is making sure that we grapple with because often we don't. We that's like something we we push to the side. We're not talking about that here, but we are here. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. here. So um <laughs> writing in the 1980s, right? Like everybody is trying to do the black womanhood, black feminism thing, and Philly is just like, this is what this is. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed this hour with you, yes. Nicole. Thank you for for joining me and accompanying me and accompanying all of us together, struggling through spillers. Yes. Um, and make sure you show up for, I think the next one about spillers is on the third. Um, yes. And the next discussion for Beloved is on Monday, I believe. So. Hey. Make sure you so, tune in and get your syllabi. And it's never yeah. too late to get your syllabus. It's never too late to join in on the reading, y'all. Join us over here on the Smart Brown Girl Book Club. And I hope everyone has a good night. Yes. <laughs>